Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Harebrain Games. Today we're going to do a review of a game called Coibra. Coibra is a game based on the city of Portugal that is a thriving hotbed of education and merchantry and happiness. And uh, anyway, if you look back through the history, it's a pretty ex interesting history of the city and the various ways that it has survived and overcome uh, quite a few invasions and just uh, cultural transitions and stuff and remains definitely uh, quite the historical uh, hotbed of different like eras of progress in this game which is two to four players you're going to vie to be the most influential person in Coimbra. And you'll do that through a variety of methods with guards, with money, with advancing on the academic track, and by canvassing the region around the city to different monasteries and uh, establishing goodwill and in effect getting victory points for all of those. What's it like? Let's take a look. Okay, first we have the manual. The manual is very richly detailed, and it's very sequential and orderly. You'll know what to do and when to do it, which makes it very easy to look up information. Then we have a panorama of the actual board setup for the two-player match we're going to try. You'll notice all the different areas of the board. These are the voyages that people can take each of the f turns on f four turns in the game. We have the board itself, we have the uh, advancement track for the academia, four different tracks that players will go up on. We have the actual map itself, which is a gorgeous little map of Coibra and the nearby areas. And then we have the locations where we're going to vie using our dice for character cards. And these character cards all have different abilities. Each row, you're going to be placing dice, and on that row, the four cards corresponding will be what you are vying for. Whoever has the highest number of dice goes first and then sequentially lower and lower to pick out which of the best cards suits them. Each of these having a different special ability as noted above. As we sweep out we go to the each player having their own little card tableau. In it you have the three castles which will hold the three dice. We have guards and we have money tracks. We also have special circular cylinder, or cylinders which will be placed on the map and on voyages both uh, to signify ownership or visitation rights. And that's generally it. The dice themselves are multicolored because there is a dual fold purpose to the dice. The numbers are used to define order when you're going for the cards, but then the colors are used for the special bonuses that you'll receive at the end of each round. Okay, first off, the first player is going to roll the dice. This is a pivotal time in a young man's life. All right, we have our selection of seven dice. That will be what we are able to use for the first of the four rounds of play. Now, the yellow player being the first goes on to the st second step. That step is to choose the dice. And the dice will be chosen based on player order. And yellow is first, red second. So he chooses his three dice castles and begins to decide where he's going to place his tile on any of those four areas. Now this top row is all special benefits the uh, castle tile will provide for free. So no one has to pay for any of these special abilities. This, for example, is two victory points and three movements on that uh, map. There are ones that give just free resources, ones that help you with voyages, etc. Now the second row is different cards. This will give you the different special abilities on the bottom as well as the ability to run up the corresponding colored track over on the map, which we'll see. Uh, some of them have sp more special abilities and are a little less straightforward, but the manual is very good about placing um, descriptions for each card. Uh, down this row, you have two coins and two move to move your 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 single citizen two spaces. This one. Uh, is a special one that only gives you points at the end of the game. So you choose that one not for what it does for you now, but for later. You'll get points based on how far up the orange track you are. And finally, this one is one that says for every two you spend of the guards, you can get a victory point, as, much, as many as you can afford. Finally, down here, we have just some pretty basic abilities to be able to choose from, each on a different row. 
example this, as many gray cubes as you choose during the E phase, which is upcoming, you will get two victory points. So now we decide, we need to use our our mind to decide where we're going to place the cubes. Obviously the higher, higher pipped uh, dice will cost more, but we'll let you choose first. And we chose there. Now red, she's going to choose one of the dice to place in order on one of the four locations. Uh, yeah, the white dice is a wild card. That one has advantages later that we will see. Uh, but for now, she's choosing to put it there on the bottom row in the hopes she can get a card that's worthy of her cost. Again, yellow chooses. Purple, a mid-range priced purple, which he will then, yep, he will place it in line for the third row. Back to, back to our red player. She has another choice to make with the colors left. Gray, gray four, maybe not. If she really wants some cash, she would choose the orange that would help her with the cash track. Nope, she's going to stick with gray. And she's going to choose a castle action. So at some point she will get something for free up there. And finally, yellow is going to take and probably choose the cheapest option. Yeah, the cheapest option, green die. And take a risk that there'll be a good card left after everyone else is solved. And that one I should have flip-flopped and put that in front of the other two. And red's last action is to choose between orange 6 or gray 5. Yep, orange 6. That will give her... Oh, and she's going to get to choose first on the victory track. All right, now we go to plan C, or phase C. Phase C is an interesting one because then now you're going to pull all your dice off. You just added them to those rows and now you're going to pull them off, but you get to activate their abilities when you do. Now one thing I'm noticing as I'm playing through here is that there was a very important step that I missed in the first phase, and I'm going to cover that before I go any farther. Okay, now one thing I missed is at the start of the game, players have to do one of two things. First off, they need to put their sojourner, their traveler, on one of the four quadrants of the main castle, or main city, Coibra. And second off, they get two starter cards um, from a set of two sets, or four sets of two, that they choose from. That give them special abilities to kind of bump up or, or route them a different way as they play. This card says that during the C phase, I pay less for guards. On the other side, red has two instant action cards uh, that bump her spaces up the up the track, two tracks, the corresponding yellow and purple tracks, and give her a little extra boost. So with that done, we're going to head back and uh, continue to play our game again, as if I didn't mess up. Anyway, so first off, uh, this goes uh, smallest to largest on the top, which is opposite of the rest of the board, which goes from left to right, highest to lowest in pip. So Red, it doesn't really matter, is going to be able to take two of those top tiles, uh, her choice. This is a special one which cheapens the voyages, that she, or the cost of the voyages if she chooses to embark on one. She could right now embark on one, an extra one, but she chooses not to. Next, uh, she has another chance with the six orange die, and she's probably going to go ahead and take that, which will give her a couple crowns, it'll give her two free victory points, and she'll be able to move up to three spaces on the map. Now, how does that work? Let's go. So she and her starter card was able to move one space for free, so that's why she's starting up there. Now she has three spaces to move. She moves to that first space into there, and she places a disc to show that she's visited, and she gets the special benefit. Now this one, instead of being an instant action, means that wherever she goes to any other place and visits, she gets a free victory point. She's going to go to the other place right now, place a, a, a coin, and she gets a victory point because of that last place she visited. This is a great one because she can move up one on every single track. Very cool. Who doesn't love traveling? And that is the end of her first and second actions. Now we're going to go into the card row. First up is yellow. 
with his orange four. So he's going to get to pick any of those that he wants that he feels are most advantageous for him to accomplish goals and earn victory points. He's going to choose, yep, he's going to choose the orange guard. He's going to place it over in his instant action pile. He's going to move himself up two spaces on the orange track. And he's going to also get four coins, which will help him with purchasing power later. Now the the uh, dummy dice all go through and they take the largest influential card to the left uh, if there's a tie. So he's going to take that three and he's also going to take out that three. So that leaves yellow with really only one choice, but it is an inexpensive choice. He's going to choose to take that. He has no choice. Well, he could. He could also just take two free guards, two free money as a as a back out kind of thing for your dice, but that's really not optimal. You want to find ways to use your cards if you can. And uh, we did forget to pay for that last one. <laughs> now we're paying for it by uh, paying the, the four cost. And I believe that everything's paid up here uh, because of the fact that we didn't have to pay for any castle tiles. Now we're going to continue on and take that gray card using the two. Yep. And this is a nice handy instant action. We're going to go ahead and pay the two cost. We're going to place that there. We're going to bump ourselves up two on the gray track. And we're going to accomplish our special bonus, which gives us four shields back. All right. And that is the end of that row. Notice that we could have, if we buy a shield one, remember that we pay one less. We clear out that second row and then begin the third row. Uh, the dummy tile goes first, which means that the most valuable of those cards, the three, is removed. And that leaves yellow with a chance for any one of those three for a cost of, a cost of three of shield or coin. He's going to go ahead and go with the coin because he likes that. At the end of the game, if he can get himself boosted up on the orange track, he's going to get some victory points, a nice chunk. So he's, his focus is going to want to be moving that up on the victory track on the yellow. And that's it for that row. And we go to the final row, where there's only one player dice left. Again, the dummy dice goes first and removes the most valuable card. In the event of a tie, the one on the left goes. And now we're going to go ahead and choose which of the last cards we're going to take advantage of. I'm going to use our coinage. What are we going to do? So, yellow or green? So, he is going to go ahead, or she is going to go ahead, sorry, and choose probably the card with the special ability during every E phase. That would be kind of cool, especially since this is the first round, which means it would be useful for three rounds, so this isn't a bad time to use that. So, he will choose, she will choose to do that. And so then, placing that in the E section, so that it's always known that during every E phase, that will be checked to decide if she gets the bonus. And that ends the conclusion of the C section from all of these. After he's done paying, she's done paying. And placing her figures. All right, we clean up the cards, and now, going to go to the D phase, which is a very quick phase. It basically means who gets to be first player. This is determined by the amount of crowns that are earned. No crowns were earned by yellow. So now we're going to count up one, two, three, four, five, six crowns for red, seven crowns. So seven to zero. So red is going to take over as, as the first player. Uh, and that's really it for, for D. D is a very fast phase. Now we go to the ever-important E phase. Now this is where your dice take on a different dimension. Instead of their value, now the color becomes significant. And since red is now first player, red gets to go first. And so what she's going to do is take her three colored dice, and she's going to activate the special ability on each one. But first, she's going to give herself two points because she has a gray die. So that E card comes into play and is advantageous right away. He goes there, her red the red marker is right there, and that gives her three guard points 
but she now gets one, two, three. Then on to orange. Orange gives her f three coins, so she's upping her resources. And finally, white is a wild. She can use it for any of the four tracks. She could do anything advantageous. She's going to choose purple because purple lets her move her her uh, little citizen one, two spaces, getting her closer to yet another place where she can get some benefits. And that's it for her section of phase E. She's going to place her dice out of the way and her, her castles go back onto her, her own player board. And now we're going to go look at E. E is going to do the same thing. Or <laughs> yellow is going to do the same thing. So, And you don't have to put the castles over there. I just do it for convenience. Uh, orange, so we get as well four resources. Purple, only one movement, but hey, it's something that gets them closer to something else. And finally, green is just flat out victory points, so you just get three points straight up. All right, and then yellow too will put his castles away and relinquish the dice so that they can be re-rolled for the second, third, and fourth rounds. All right, final phase, phase F. Phase F is all about voyages. Each player gets a chance to pay the cost to participate in a voyage. Voyages have special abilities at the end of the game. In this case, the, the uh, gray and orange tracks are counted up, divided by two, and whoever participated in that voyage gets victory points. Same there, guards, coins, and, and uh, crowns divided by two. This one's whoever has, you get three points for every card above ten that you've earned, etc., etc. So red has some opportunity there to decide if she wants to pay the cost to participate in a voyage for end game victory points. In this case, she can pay coins for the three on the left and shields for the three on the right. She is going to go ahead and partake in a voyage. She feels good about that and she's going to place her, her token there to signify that she will participate in the voyage. And because she has the special tile she took, she also gets to pay two less, which means she only had to pay um, a five instead of seven, I believe, on that voyage. So that's done. Now yellow gets to decide what it's going to do, and if it has a particular voyage it would like to partake on, if it's willing to pay the coinage or the guardianship resources to do so. Looking at all the options, he feels probably inclined to go for, yes, so you get a point for each voyage that you're part of. So it kind of recurses onto itself. So two points, actually, for each voyage that you're part of. So he has to pay the cost for that, which he will do so off camera while I go ahead and finish the full game. And then I will bring us back in to conclude by showing you the scoring at the end of the game. Right now, we're just going to wrap up and prepare for part two. And then we'll be back. Okay, now we've played a full game, and we're ready to start the scoring phase so you can get an example of what scoring's like. Notice that everybody's moved around. Red has a substantial lead over yellow right now. Phase one is to go through the voyages. So, the first voyage says count the gray and the orange uh, uh, progression on the track, divide by two, and give yourself the points. So, for yellow, it's six and nine is 15 divided by two is uh, 7, because it's rounded down. And so 7 points for yellow. Okay, and 7 points for red, because they also participated in the journey. Now, the next one is count up all the guards and the coins and the crowns, divide by 2, and give yourself those points. Yellow is the only one participated, so it's 5 plus 12 is 17, no crowns, 17 divided by 2 is 8. 8 points for yellow. Now, the next one is each card past 10 is worth 3 points. So how many cards does yellow have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So 9 points for yellow takes his first lead. All right. Next we have the voyage that says you get a point for every single voyage you are on. 
uh, yellow has more voyages than red, and so yellow's going to get a little bit more pointage. And uh, red's going to get not quite the pointage, I believe it's six points for red. All right. And finally, the last one, and this is a doozy, is that for every place that red visited on the map is a victory point. So looking over towards the map, one, two, three, four, five, six. So six points will be granted to red, and they take the lead. And that's it for the voyages. The next scoring phase is going to be the four tracks of progression with their victory points at the top. Now the interesting here is that the, the topmost player is going to get the, the, op, the top points, obviously. But in a two-player game, you have to be within three in order to be able to get the second place points. So in this case, we're going to start with the gray track. Yellow is going to get the topmost points. They're going to get the full points for their for their uh, extension there. And then red, because they're within three, are going to get the second place points. So I'm pretty close. And I flip-flopped in the orange track where Red is going to get the full points, and yellow is going to get the second place points. However, I blatantly forgot to add those points on the track and just went on to purple. So that's where we'll continue on and sigh to ourselves that I messed up. Red only gets points for purple because yellow is way too far away. And then finally the green track where yellow is going to get points, but then red also gets points. So yellow is going to give themselves the green track. And red is going to follow suit and get the second place points, which will bump red right back out to the lead. And that will end that particular portion. Now we move on to the E cards, and, or sorry, the end game cards. And this one, for every set of five different colored matches, or f four different colored matches, there's five victory points. Unfortunately, red only had one gray card, so there was only one match, but it's still five points. Yellow, on the other hand, has the card that says based on how far they progressed along that orange track and they progress to nine, they will get the bottom tier of victory points, which will give them, I believe, five. And so both that was a net, net sum of zero gain or loss for either one on that. And now we go to the what well, isn't talked about a lot, which is these little diploma-like things. And if you collect sets of different colored diplomas, you get points for it. If you collect all five, you get 12. Collect four, you get eight, etc., etc. Bottom line is uh, eight points for the uh, for the yellow player for the four different symbols. So that's just basically a freebie of eight points. And we go to the red player and totally forget about those. So forget the scoring. I forgot that, but we'll go to the next phase. And the last phase of scoring is going to be adding up everybody's guard points, money points, and crowns, and dividing it by two. So one crown plus 15, 722, 23 divided by two is 11. Um, so 11 points. And then for yellow, it's 12 plus 5 is 17. No crowns. 17 divided by is 8. So eight points. So we knew we missed some points there. Chances are, I think I uh, recalculated it in red one. Uh, so, but anyway, that's an example of how the scoring goes. And now we'll get to my final thoughts. All right, let's talk about my final thoughts on Coimbra. Now, let's go over the cons first and touch on those details. Uh, it is, um, for casual gamers, probably a lot of icon iconographic interpretation um, that can lead to some overload. I had the same issues with a game called Roma, uh, which was all pictorial, and um, I struggled introducing it to, to new casual players. And then Roma 2 came out and had text for everything as well as the icons, and that just, Roma was gone. Roma 2 became the game of choice because people could learn it so quickly. Um, so something about that, once again, mostly for, for casual gamers, the iconography is saved in a lot of ways and mitigated by its consistency. Uh, once you learn the base symbols, uh, you can logically infer the rest of, of what's going on for most of the cases of the cards I've seen. Um, also very well mitigated by a fully explained glossary. Uh, you won't have a problem quickly finding what a card or a symbol means, and that's a good thing. Um, 
newer players might be overwhelmed the first round with that thing going on, but after that, it, it's not a problem. The cards and uh, castle bonuses and the random arranged map of the regions and the dice numbers and the colors might be that's a lot of vectors of input for a, for a casual game. Once again, all of my almost all of my cons would be mostly just caveats more than cons on this game, to be honest. Um, casual folks would be pressed on on some of these factors, but the fun uh, you hope may swing the tide in their staying persistent to learning it and and uh, and, and you know having a great time. Um, the one thing that I thought was a little subdued were the voyages. I was kind of expecting more of a uh, they're really just end game conditions and they're not really masked very well. They didn't feel like voyages to me. I think it might have been cooler to me to have some sort of uh, Con conflicting, uh, even if it's just I take a voyage, you can't, or if I take the f voyage first, you don't get as much benefit in the second, something like that, sort of like they did with the tracks, where I could feel like, hey, I did a voyage, and because I, I, I funded it first, I'm going to get a benefit. I didn't feel that. Um, that's the cons that I have, and I, as you can tell, they're, they're really minor caveats at best. Now let's get into the pros and the things I do like about Coimbra. Um, the Coimbra game and everything about it is just charm that is oozing from the entire life cycle of this prod of this game. It's got a disarming, inviting box art. It has a board map that looks like something out of a whimsical Nintendo game. Uh, its card art is inviting and lighthearted. Uh, dice place. Uh, that, yeah, the dice with dice. How do you make them lighthearted? Um, but I did really enjoy the charming visuals that really brought me into the game world and and made it interesting for me. Um, the dice placement itself isn't really a mentally burdensome. I mean, like, hey, the numbers matter here, the colors matter here, but the risk reward of it certainly is because you're taking a lot of time to to think about the double decision you have to make. Uh, I want to activate this track and get this benefit, but do I want to you know? But is it am I going to pay more in trying to get cards over here, colors over there? Um, there's a solid player scaling system, I think, with the dice, with the uh, the dummy dice that go on there, so that you do realize that you won't get first, second, or third pick if you choose fourth. You'll know that ahead of the time. There's no there's no hidden information in that regard. It still wouldn't be my favorite with two players. I think three would be a little more contention and maybe maybe bring alive a, a, a few more elements of contention that might add some a little excitement. Um, it's highly predictable, and so you you see once the dice are rolled, you can you can map out a lot of what's going on. You'll see everything that could transpire that round, and that's kind of a nice thing to be able to hang your hat on. I like that it uh, the mutual funneling of results into subsystems. Uh, the dice feed into the cards and bonuses. The advancement track feeds into more gold and guards to pay for the cards. Um, that in the giving you the purchase power to do cards and voyages, it works so smoothly that it doesn't feel like there are any towering walls to overcome to feel the beneficial, beneficial impact of your actions. Everything you do that's going to give you a benefit is just right nearby, and I like that. Um, the various resources are tuned to not feel too starved too often. You're not, oh my gosh, I can never get another guy out here, Agricola, looking at you. Um, you. You do feel like if you balance it right, there is a way to get resources enough to be able to do interesting things and not feel constantly starved of, of possibilities. Um, this is not a game of what can't you do. Um, for the most part, more than it's a game of what's the most beneficial thing I can do right now with my dice on this board. It's almost sort of like the common question we get today of what brings me joy. Um, anyway, that's that's it for the cons. Now let's get to my final thoughts. And my final thoughts are that Coimbra reminds me very much of a company I call Blizzard, which happened to be a you know, quintessential company that doesn't do massive innovation. It does massive pollination as in polishing other people's innovation to a degree that it makes the sum of what it does substantially more entertaining and f and, and and awesome to be honest than their parts whether it's a Diablo Warcraft World of Warcraft it, it's not any they don't take formulas and make something brand new and innovative and crazy and that's where this this 
the po- uh, the, the real benefit of the slice, the, the rolling dice and having it be worth that gimmick, that, you know, that gimmick, but that innovation is not even remotely innovative enough to keep a game going. I wouldn't have bought it just because it has dice that let you do that. Um, it's the fact that everything works together so smoothly, seamlessly. You feel, you know, if you've heard of death by a thousand cuts, consider joy by a thousand level ups where every little thing you do is just going to level you up a little bit here, get you to the next detente of interesting things and bonuses that you get. Uh, it just a joy. Um, the emergent, it's sort of like the progression track reminds me of Gaia Project, where you have that. The emerging victory point paths and the sets, a little bit like Seven Wonders, kind of. Um, you have dice placement, reminiscent to like Kingsburg, maybe with a, you know, with a little extra gimmicky. You have that monastery map that really reminds me of kind of a branching Tokaido, where everywhere you go is friendly and advantageous. It's just a matter of how optimally you want to take that advantage to its farthest degree. Card selection kind of reminds me a little bit of Dynasties, an old game. Anyway, at its heart, it's quite a simple placement game. That should not be taken away. If you strip away the charm and stared at Koi Brazil at Underbelly, eh, you would have a pure, almost direct actions beget point system. The beauty here is that the there's a breadth of opportunities to get victory points. There's not a depth of opportunity. Contrast this with another game that I'm playing at the same called Teotihuacan, which has multiple layers deep of ways that you imbue actions. Those actions trigger other possible actions. Those actions can do other things and mess with the board. And then finally, at the end of that trail, you find out how it could it could jockey you into a position for points. There's none of that here. It's I put this down which means that I'm going to get this many victory points for this thing. And that's okay. That's exactly what I'm looking for and what I'm liking about this game, is that I could really introduce it to people that I couldn't introduce a whole host of other games of its like to before because of it. And I like it. I feel very immersed with it. I feel like you get really interesting choices. The time frame of the game is right. Um, you know, you... Like I said, you strip it away, you stare at its underbelly, it's just a simple system. But you don't strip it away, and you don't want to look at its underbelly any more than you want to sneak behind Disneyland and lose the magic. You know, you want to immerse yourself in it, and you want to know that every chance, everything you do, every choice you have is a chance to rejoice at how much farther you've progressed. So highly, highly recommend this game to anyone who, who loves a... a, a basic, simple, but very well-polished worker placement game. So Coimbra for the win. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Hairbrain Games.